So this class is going to be uh, on the topic of discussing what is a limit to growth. I'm sure all of you have heard that we most certainly live in a world where we do have limits to growth. But um, I want to challenge that question today in terms of, uh, you know, because it seems like a rather simplistic question, what determines a limit to growth? And most people will say, well, we live obviously in a world of limited resources, uh, fixed resources. But um, it turns out the answer to such a question is not so simple when we think about it a little bit more deeply. Uh, for instance, what determines the limit to a resource? Um, is a specific resource something that is fixed in its amount, in its availability on Earth? Uh, can a resource only be used up and not reproduced or regenerated? Well, we know that that's not the case. So if a resource can be regenerated, the limit to that specific resource will be determined by the rate that it is used versus the rate that it is produced. All resources that are essential to life, including human life, are naturally renewable. There is a natural cycle that causes these resources to be regenerated. This includes natural cycles of water, oxygen, vegetation, including food and so forth. Thus, everything that is essential for life is already naturally renewable on Earth. However, what some have become concerned with is that we are using these resources too quickly with the rate of human population growth such that these renewable resources will become limited to the point that it will cause a collapse in civilization and rapid depopulation due to extreme scarcity. Um, our next slide. So this is a Malthusian uh, growth model. Um, sorry, I have to navigate through this, which I'm sure most of you have seen. Um, so the point of catastrophe, right, is when human population exceeds food production on, a, on a, a basic level. However, again, the question is, what determines the carrying capacity? When Thomas Malthus himself uh, constructed this model, it never gave a, a specific number as to what the carrying capacity would be. This is because it was understood, even though there was a lot of cynicism that we would eventually meet our carrying capacity, it was understood that we could actually uh, change our carrying capacity based off of the innovations that we create for ourselves um, by, you know, increasing the efficiency of our resources, the use of our resources, but that we could actually also affect things like food production, the efficiency of food production. Nonetheless, Thomas Malthus predicted that we would hit our carrying capacity in 1890, about 100 years from when he made the prediction. And as we see, the historical accuracy for these types of predictions um, are often very off the mark. They've all been off the mark in, in terms, obviously, of uh, ones that have predicted doomsday before our time. But nonetheless, people never get tired of that. Um, there's also the concern that we are living with limited space. Obviously, there is a fixed amount of space on Earth, surface area on Earth. So if we continue to grow, won't we eventually hit that limit, at least with space? Um, here's a, a picture of a... <laughs> what a dystopic uh, future apartment will look like where you know basically we'll be living in in large closets the quality of life will be very low we'll we'll all be like barcodes for people um however this is a, a picture made by uh Vsauce, um who has a youtube channel and uh this video was uh how many things are there it's a, it's a pretty extreme example, but what it showcases is that if you were to just take the sheer mass of the human population and just put it in a pile uh, somewhere on Earth, um, it would not be enough to even fill the, the Grand Canyon, which is in this case, this is a picture of, uh, of the Grand Canyon. That's just, just to give you an idea of how much mass we actually take up in the world. A more humane example, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard, is that Texas, which is quite large, 
uh, about 700,000 kilometers square could fit the Earth's population of 7.4 billion today, um, roughly uh, such that uh, each person could get a 33 foot by 33 foot plot, enough to fit a townhouse for every person on the planet. So you wouldn't even need to stack people up. Theoretically, if you could use every surface of Texas, you could do this. You wouldn't even need to have um, apartment buildings with people living on top of each other. So that, again, is another factor for putting things into perspective of, of how much space do we actually have on Earth. This is um, a graph uh, on the top of the world food production. Um, as you can see, if you compare from 1960 to 1980, the growth rate for food is not anywhere near as much as the growth rate from 1980 to 2000, for instance. And if you look at the population difference, the population difference is not that much, you know, in terms of 1960 to 1980, we increased approximately 1.4 billion. And by uh, 1980 to 2000, we increased by uh, about 1.7. And today we're, we've increased by another about 1.7 billion every 20 years. So the amount the rate of our increase in population size is actually slower than the rate of food production. And if you look at the, the graph below, we see that um, the amount of uh, land that we are using per, uh, per capita has actually decreased because we've increased our efficiency. Um, and this is uh, including cropland. So um, we aren't really hitting our carrying capacity. We're nowhere near hitting our carrying capacity today. However, we do have lack of resources in localized regions, uh, lack of food and water. Uh, but these shortages are not occurring because we have a lack of resources, but it really is uh, occurring for political and economic reasons, um, which I'll get a little bit into later on. So again, to stress, we actually have plenty and there's a lot more we can do to increase the efficiency of food production um, and such that nutrition also doesn't have to be affected. We can actually increase the efficiency of nutrition as well, which um, I think I should bring up in this slide that we have done this right in the past before we even knew about genetics. We've increased the efficiency of nutrition in things like corn, apple, bananas, you know, watermelon, so forth. Um, and we've created livestock that didn't exist before. But, um, you know, for vegetarians out there, I think this is a, a better example that we have actually been able to uh, qualitatively change, not just quantitatively change the resources that we have available to us just in terms of, of food, which was the major reason why we were able to have uh, such a, a shoot off in population growth during the uh, the 18th to 20th centuries. Um, so it's not even a bad thing, right? When we look in context of the amount of space we have and so forth, which I'm going to get into some more. This is a a display of the amount of uh, population density distrib distribution in the world. Um, so you can see that the areas that are most populated in the world are uh, in Africa, it's uh, Nigeria, Ethiopia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, India is very, very uh, densely populated. And you see Eastern Asia, primarily China. China and India do have the biggest populations in the world right now. So the common conception is that if the whole, first of all, these areas, because they're so densely populated, they must suffer from terrible overcrowding in their cities, which I'm going to I'm going to uh, showcase um, in a little bit. And so it's very scary when people, especially like you look at North America, where we live in, in Canada, it doesn't even look like anybody lives there. Um, something like what we see in India and China looks very scary for us because we think, by God, like we're going to be living like we're in ant colonies or, or something like that. But it turns out, especially when looking at China as the model that you 
don't have to have uh, over, you don't actually have an experience of overcrowding in these cities. And as I've shown with the Texas uh, model, we can, if we can fit the whole population already in Texas with townhouses, it gives you an idea that overcrowding in cities is more of an issue of standard of living. It's an economic issue. And it's also how you choose to organize your cities. Um, so looking at China, which I believe India has uh, the, the largest population, China's number two. China's 1.4 billion people, roughly, with uh, 9.6 million square kilometers. To compare, Canada is 38 million, which is about the population of California, um, and it's about 10 million uh, square kilometers. The UK is 67 million with uh, 242,000 square kilometers. The US is 330 million with 9.8 million square kilometers. Shanghai is the most populated uh, city in China, which we see a picture of here. They have 26.3 million. Probably, I don't know what it is now, but I would suspect that it's a lot closer to the Canadian population now with 6,000 square kilometers. So you would imagine, wow, they must suffer from serious overcrowding issues. Um, well, I don't know if anyone's had a chance to visit Shanghai, but it's actually a really beautiful uh, city. This is a picture of the largest park in Shanghai called Cent Century Park, uh, which is 346 acres. But there are many other parks in Shanghai. There's there's actually many parks all throughout China. They, they make uh, a, a point to have this. And um, their cities are actually very beautiful in the way that they're organizing their cities for to accommodate the increase in population is always with this in mind that there is there is a balance between having you know these types of parks along with uh, you know accommodation for housing. So you're not going to be living in these concrete jungles um, with the way that you know China is organizing itself. Beijing is the the capital of China. It's I believe the second most populated city in China. It's 21 million with 16,000 square kilometers. And um, here is a, a picture of the Chaoyang Park, which already exists, but this is um, these are pictures of what they're planning on doing to increase the 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 aesthetics of of the place um to you know have more they already have trees and and the the the, the lake there but they want to increase you know it so that it looks more like like this and you can see on the left uh here's a plan of of how you can have growth in between buildings even so that it's not all uh only very good spiritually for you so that you don't live in these like dead concrete jungles where everybody feels like a number um but it's also uh very good for um controlling the climate in these areas and and also for cleaning your air obviously so what does canada's population density look like and you know the us it's it's not it's not really even though the US has a lot more people, you can see from this map, it's not like that striking either. This is Canada's, this is Canada's population density right now. So um, what can I say? Uh, that's, that's a lot of uh, unused land that it's not to say that we need to, you know, have ourselves in every plot of land in the world but at the same time this whole concept that we're running out of space is is most definitely uh not accurate and you know with with advances in technology we can actually comfortably um have people living in the the northern territories um as well which we will we will have um, as we develop more and more our cap capabilities of going into space, we'll be able to to grow these kind of domed villages in, in the north northern uh, hemisphere, for instance, and you can have a, a, a very beautiful life 
you can have clean warm air you know living in the north a better better living standard than what we are currently presenting uh experiencing living in montreal quebec where we have half of the year is winter which is not the most pleasant thing this is a map of um <clears throat> how much i don't know the technical term but like the amount of green <laughs> in the world and again, another paradox is that China and India that have the largest populations are amongst the most green. This is, um, this is a, a chart developed by NASA. Actually, what we find out is that China and India have become the most green in terms of man-made um, innovations in this. Uh, they've been able to uh, turn uh, desertif desertification into um, thriving ecosystems that are now forests. Uh, this is obviously very important because it manages it. First of all, it provides for the people more. You have more access to food and water when you have this type of, uh, you know, luscious land versus desert um, another thing is that it's very good for temperature control if we're worried that the the globe is overheating which is uh debatable obviously planting a lot of greenery is going to reduce temper uh temperatures uh cities that get very hot during the summer it's because you have a lot of concrete and not a lot of not a lot of trees if you ever notice going from the city to the countryside there's a huge temperature difference there's also a huge difference in quality of air so how are the the most populated countries in the world able to fit so many forests it's another another thing to think about right are we really lacking space in that sense um <clears throat> This is another concern for people. This is a, a poster from Mad Max, is that we're gonna run out of water. And the future is going to be about water wars. Now, a theme that we need to keep in mind throughout this class is that um, not only are resources naturally renewable, but we have clearly seen that with our own innovations, we can, in harmony with nature, just make those cycles more efficient more rapid so obviously if we don't do uh innovations you could argue that we would hit lim we would have hit limits already much more quickly obviously if we hadn't made innov innovations for instance in food production um and the same case goes for water it isn't just you know for us to use up water and then wait for the the wells to dry up so presently there's over 16 million square kilometers of a world desert which is estimated to be two-thirds of the of the world sahara makes up about 9.2 million square kilometers of this area although i don't know how accurate this is now with uh, the kind of greenery programs that have been going on um because there's definitely been a lot of uh, improvement in this over the years. Um, and like I said, obviously, if we were to plant, uh, we were to green the Sahara Desert, for instance, like the, the Sahel, which is uh, south of the Sahara Desert, is uh, usually lush and it, and it fluctuates, you know, throughout the seasons. But part of the reason why we have extreme temperature is because we have these uh, very stark contrast between very green areas and very hot um, desertified areas. I don't know if that's the right term, uh, desert areas. So the Sahara, for instance, with air going over the Sahara, it becomes very hot. Then it goes over the ocean. It gets cooled down very quickly. And you can have phenomenons like hurricanes, which can hit the United States from that. If we were to green the, the Sahara, we would be able to control uh, that type of uh, extreme weather um, more uh, more precisely. Um, so obviously, this is a crisis in many places in the world: uh, lack of water, lack of clean water, 
that people have to walk very far for their water. Um, and again, this is localized, right? It's not to say that there is a shortage of water, but there is a, a shortage of water in, in localized regions, which we can see that we can actually affect this in um, very easy ways. Alan Savory, he did a TED talk, which people can, um, can check out on the internet, has um, found a way to increase the amount of vegetation in areas simply through grazing methods with livestock, because he found that by having livestock go through these areas, um, and it's the, the natural way that uh, herding used to occur before they they did it in I think that now they keep them penned up in one place or something and it it, uh, it doesn't really work out they found that if you rotate uh, the livestock through controlled segments of land you're increasing you, the livestock's you know waste is actually fertilizer for these areas their uh, their foot uh, thumping around is also helping the vegetation to uh, like get rid of its like dry material that can can like uh, become kind of necrotic, you can say necrotic tissue. So having these like livestock go through there is actually helping regenerate these areas just from that simple method. And he has really striking examples like this one in Zimbabwe. This is one in Arizona. Um, Again, uh, I believe that one is out. This one's definitely Alan Savory again, using these methods. So that's um, that's something that's very accessible for anybody. Um, it's uh, a, a program that he's you know tried to start in um, certain areas in in Africa, and it is really just education because uh, you know these these areas already uh, are into. Um, having livestock. So it's just, you know, a way to figure out how to better manage your livestock, which will also be happier. And uh, the vegetation can also flourish under the simple system. And again, I don't have the time to go through that, but you can, you can check that out on, uh, on TED Talk. Another way that we can um, affect the water availability, availability is through weather control, which is tapping into atmospheric rivers. And um, I went into this in more detail in the class I did at, at, in Moscow. I won't have enough time with this presentation because I want to cover a lot more. But um, all to say is that there's been multiple studies. These graphs I took from Ben Deniston. Uh, there's been multiple studies of uh, periods where low solar activity has been associated with high galactic influence, including, including cosmic rays that affect the amount of rainfall and also the amount of glaciation formation. That's one thing we have to also remind ourselves is that, um, you know, what affects weather, what affects climate is not just contained within the Earth's atmosphere, but obviously we're traversing through the universe, um, which is going to have effects on um, our climate in ways that we're still uh, figuring out. Um, but even for our sun's activity, for instance, we have no idea how to predict the uh, sunspots that affect how strong and how weak the sun is going to be um, in its long fluctuations of, of activity. So these are things that as we study them more, uh, we'll have a, a, a better understanding. Um, so again, this I believe is from uh, Ben Dennison and, and uh, Jason Ross. We see that uh, in different galactic environments, so the squiggly uh, line at the top is our, um, our solar system traversing through uh, our galaxy. And uh, we can see that um, in viewing things over long periods of time, you can see 32 million years, you know, between the trough and the crest, um, that we are experiencing extreme temperature changes um, in uh, that are thought to be associated with, for instance, the ice age and things like this, but it's not just us traversing up and down like this throughout the uh, the plane of the galaxy. But if you look at the picture below where it's 
thought that we are traversing through these arms as well, which is going to be affecting where, depending on where you are and which arm you're in in the galaxy is also going to affect so that we could hit, you know, really cold ice ages or we could hit really hot, you know, uh, fronts as well. Um, and these are things that we can possibly, you know, prepare for in the in the future. Um, so a study by Perez and Perezza found that modulation of fluxes of galactic cosmic rays could cause the Earth's period of ice ages, like I said. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, this picture is a, is a picture of how we could, um, and it has been done, collect rainfall through uh, us being able to uh, create clouds, basically. Um, so uh, the Pulinets is a, a Russian scientist who, who did this in Mexico, where he was able to increase rainfall using, you can see on the right, it's an iron tower with uh, thin uh, wires to these peripheral towers. And uh, with a positive potential at the top, you can actually uh, attract, uh, create an electrical field, which will create uh, water molecules, which will become nuclei, which will raise and to be to form clouds. And um, if you if you have it by the coast, you obviously can collect more uh, water because there's so much water right by the coast. And what you can do if you look at the top picture to the left is by um, doing like a positive and a negative and then a positive and a negative potential throughout as you go further inland, you can uh, direct the water through cloud formation inland. And uh, Polinets was able to fill three dams in Mexico using this technology in one and a half years, they were able to fight off forest fires in the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, it's estimated that they increased uh, precipitation 20 to 30% in the areas that they used it. So this has a lot of promise and it's not, it's not very expensive either. Um, so again, this sort of technology, uh, it's, it's, it's a natural thing, you know, we're basically figuring out how cloud formation is occurring and then we're able to just naturally enhance that cycle that already exists in nature um it's not you know a form of corruption or uh you know uh, uh an abnormality that we're introducing into things um i don't want to say anything to that uh and just as an example uh <laughs> I only found out about this recently, which is amazing, but this is like an, a natural occurrence in nature um, where uh, this is called sprites or red sprites, which are large scale electric discharges that occur high above thunderstorm clouds. So we don't see them because the thunderstorm clouds, you know, cover them up when you're on the ground. But a lot of pilots were freaked out about this for <laughs> for decades, thinking that it was like aliens obviously like that does look pretty alien like uh to me um and we've uh we've come to realize that this is actually uh this is this is this is um triggered by discharges of of positive char positively charged lightning uh between thunderclouds and the ground i don't fully understand how it works uh so again just to tell you that there's so much of our world that is there for us to not only discover, but we can we can naturally enhance. And that's that's not a bad thing. That's that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. We should be optimistic about uh, this this sort of stuff. Um, again, uh, just to give an idea of the electromagnetic field that we live in, which is uh, super important. Um, and uh, affects again weather um, is that uh, the northern lights, for instance, are oxygen and nitrogen particles that have been excited, which cause green and red uh, lines uh, you see in the sky. This is from uh, sun and galactic cosmic rays that have uh, a lot of high energy and are sources of ionization. So, 
in the future, and not even the distant future, because this technology is not very expensive, uh, you can see how we could uh, gain further understanding in weather control such that we can affect rainfall and we can have uh, the greening of deserts in uh, a very effective way and, and an increasing of, of biodiversity. I think it's a win-win for, for everything. Um, another thing is that ironically the whole uh you know fear about co2 uh plants love co2 so you know the more plants that uh we grow the the more co2 is going to be processed and again the more resources we will have the more resources life in general will have we will be able to uh, control the temperature on earth uh much better it will also uh reduce extreme uh weather phenomena like hurricanes and and so forth um and we can also use it um when we uh go to the moon or mars uh, at some point in the future to produce our food in a super effective way these these things what do they do they pump 1500 parts per million of carbon dioxide uh in these like closed systems and uh the co2 in the earth's atmosphere is 400 parts per million so anyway all to say is that plants really like co2 and uh we like plants um so i'll start getting a little bit into the other side's uh viewpoint of uh the limits to growth um, I think most of us are familiar with it, but this is uh, a study from the Club of Rome that happened in uh, 1972 that were predicted that we would, um, depending, I think, on the, the year that it was published, either at the turn of the century or within 100 years, we would hit uh, a crisis point where we would basically have um, a, you know, uh, a complete breakdown in civilization. Civilization would collapse because for, for numerous ways, which I'm gonna, from numerous different reasons, from numerous different reasons, which I'll go into. Um, and so when this was published in 1972, funny enough, I find it very convenient timing. In 1973, there was Australia's largest computer, which predicted uh that uh population levels population growth availability of natural resources and quali quality of life on earth would uh all plummet um and it it was actually much more stark than um 100 years from now they were predicting they were predicting um where's my thought i had it up they were predicting it to be like by our period pretty much a lot of the projections Sorry, I'm gonna play you a video of it. <sighs> Why is this being so annoying? Okay. Yeah, it's like acting so weird. I have it right here. Okay, just gonna do this quick share screen. Gotta make sure that you hit oh, uh, right share there. sound. Share sound? Yeah. All right. You can see that? Yep. It's not some science fantasy effect from 2001. This electronic display emanating from Australia's largest computer is a picture of the condition past, present and future of planet Earth. The program was originally devised by a scientist working from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Jay Forrester. It was developed under the auspices of the Club of Rome by an MIT research team to present a complex model of the world and what we humans are doing to it. The program called World One doesn't pretend to be a precise forecast. What it does for the first time in man's history on the planet is to look at the world as one system. It shows that Earth cannot sustain present population and industrial growth for much more than a few decades. It shows that simply cleaning up our car exhausts and making some small effort to limit our families simply isn't enough. It's like an electronic guided tour of our global behavior since 1900 and where that behavior will lead us. Well, 
this is the printed version of what we've just seen on the television screen. And what looks at first to be just a maze of computer characteristics is really a system of very simple graphs which project what's going to happen to the planet over the next 150 years if we don't do something drastic to stop it. Down the left-hand side of the graph is the date, 1900, 1940, 1980, 2020, right down to 2060. Now, each of these lines of, of, of letters represents a curve showing some aspect of the condition of the planet. The further out this way they go, the greater that figure is, the further this way, uh, the less. For example, P represents population. So here it is at 1900 and then it comes up to 1940, it starts to take off. Here we are at 1980, up to the turn of the century, and then it starts to peter off. Let's now have a look at this next curve, the Q curve, which is the quality of life. And this is represented by, for example, the amount of space people have, the uh, amount of money they have to spend, the amount of food they have to eat. Now, it increases rapidly up to 1940, but from 1940 on, the quality of life diminishes and here we are about the turn of the century and we come up to the year 2020 and it's really come right back more people of course means that you start to chew up your supply of natural resources and this is this curve here the end curve that shows that slowly but steadily the pool of natural wealth in the world natural resources minerals oil and so on is slowly but steadily diminishing so this is the situation as population increases the quality of life decreases and the supply of natural resources decreases. But have a look at this curve here. This is called the Z curve and it represents pop, uh, pollution. Now, predictably enough, as the population increases up to 1980, pollution increases. There's more rubbish. But from 1980 to the year 2020, pollution really takes off. This is assuming, of course, that we don't do anything about it. So the year 2020, the condition of the planet be, starts to become highly critical. And if we don't do anything about it, this is what's going to happen. The quality of life is going to go right back to practically zero. Pollution is going to become so serious, right out here, that it will start to kill people. So the population will diminish. Right back here, less than it was in the year 1900. And at this stage, round about the year 2040, 2050, civilized life as we know it on this planet will cease to exist. Well, hopefully, of course, it, it won't be allowed to happen, but it's taken this kind of shock treatment to nudge governments into doing something, and slowly we are. We're starting to clean up our atmosphere. We're starting to recycle our rubbish. We're doing something positive about population control. But so far, our efforts have really been just a drop in the ocean. The Club of Rome comprises some 70 men of widely varying backgrounds, but their common concern is that the world problems cannot be solved by individual nations. I spoke with Professor Hugo Tiemann, director of the Battelle Institute Geneva, Dr. Aurelio Pache, founder of the club, and Dr. Alexander King, director of the World Bank and the United Nations OECD. Dr. King, now you're describing the world as a closed system where all these things are interrelated, and yet the government, the control of the system is by individual nation states. Now, how do you convince them to cooperate? The sovereignty of these nations is no longer as absolute as it was. There's a gradual diminishing, whittling away of sovereignty, little bit by little bit. Uh, especially, of course, in the smaller countries where it's more obvious, but the bigger countries have to do a good deal of this by agreeing with in to international arrangements for uh, the law of the seas, or for the limits of fishing, or for control of, uh, of the wavelengths in radio, and 101 other things. But uh, especially in the technological field, I think, this is going to be increasingly so because of developments next year. I was at an important meeting in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and Peterson, the former Secretary of Commerce, was saying the same thing from an economic point of view, that the general world economic situation, the interdependence of countries on their food and fuels and so on, is leading to an interdependence which has seeds of draining away of sovereignty within it. So I don't think one can envisage an idealistic of jumping to a world federalism or anything of that sort. 
but the building up probably in the next uh, decade in a number of uh, particularly sensitive fields like energy, raw materials, uh, the use of the oceans, space and so on, of a number of uh, what people are tending to call regimes, which will not be ordinary United Nations type of organizations, but semi-management organizations. There'd be a great deal of consent in them. Dr. Bachet views the European common market as an elementary example of the kind of regional cooperative which is going to... I think I'll stop it there, uh, but you know, people can watch the whole thing um, on their own time. Um, and just to make the point again that uh, these, the Club of Rome is uh, at the very core of um, the type of economic planning that we, oh no, is it gonna start at the beginning? Um, that we see, oh, okay, today with the World Economic Forum, for instance, the Club of Rome was pretty much there almost at the very beginning, I think the second year or so when the World Economic Forum was formed. Um, and this has really sh done a lot to shape global policy to this day. So um, it's very important to know where, you know, uh, it came from. Uh, this is one of the projections which I got from uh, Jason Ross. He uh, he did a, a presentation this past summer uh, under "There are no limits to growth to mankind's." Oh, sorry, there are no limits to mankind's growth, and this is just uh, an example that they had from their computer. Um, where they were predicting chromium availability, right? Because this happened in 1970 when this computer, or 1973 when this computer made these predictions. And as you can see, you know, we're past the 2020 point um, and we can kind of see whether, how these predictions have so far been panning out. In the case of chromium, if you see to the left, they were predicting that the reserves would go down. Um, and as the reserves go down, the cost goes up. Uh, I'm pointing at the screen like you can see me actually pointing. As the reserves go down, the cost goes up. And then because of that, the usage will obviously go down uh, as the, it, it becomes too expensive. And we continue to use it until we eventually have uh, no more or hardly any of the reserves because it'll be too expensive to use them at that point. To the right, we see what Jason has uh, put up of what has actually happened in reality, which is that the reserves of chromium have increased, um, which I think is due to uh, our efficiency in um, uh, mining it, but pos possibly other uh, reasons as well. I'm not sure if we are also able to create uh, it as well at this point. Uh, we will most definitely in the future, which I'll discuss shortly. So the reserves have gone up and our usage has gone up so high that this chart, you would need two and a half charts upwards to show our usage rate. So totally off the mark already, this perfect computer that they have, right? Um, that's just a very clear example. So their computer is predicting, you know, that I don't have time to go over this, but they ran a whole bunch of scenarios, you know, let's the, the one on the left is our reserves are of a certain amount. You're no matter what, you're going to get a population collapse in the one to the right. You see, well, let's say natural resources are actually double what we think they are. Well, we're still going to get uh, a population collapse around the same point. I don't even understand how that works. If we have unlimited resources, well, we'll be killed uh, or no. Yeah. If we have unlimited resources with pollution controls, we're still going to have uh, a problem because we will what we'll have to cap our industry, right? Because if we control the pollution, we have to cap our industry and then we can't support our population past a certain amount. If you look to the right, uh, with unlimited resources, population control, increased agricultural productivity, and perfect birth control, we will still die horrible deaths because uh, of uh, pollution, it seems. I don't know. Anyway, no matter what they were putting into their system, the prediction was always 
the same and kind of around the same point too, which is I find a little bit odd that we would die horrible deaths before 2100. Um, again, keeping in mind that they couldn't even predict chromium availability usage and cost like 50 years into the future, I would take such predictions with a, a grain of salt. And these predictions have, uh, you know, caused us to to say that we need to put a, a, a cap on industry, uh, a cap on uh, even energy, which is obviously uh, causing uh, people to artificially be in a lower standard of living than what they could be with the resources we have. So it's not the shortage of resources that are causing the uh, low standard of living. It's the policies that are dictating how these things are used, because we're told we're going to die horrible deaths no matter what, maybe not even by 2100, maybe it's 2200, maybe it's 2400. But the point being, we will die horrible deaths at some point. So why, like, let's start now by drastically de decreasing the population which nobody likes to talk about requires the horrible living standards of this chunk of of the world um there's you know the other i think idea that as you can see we're very lucky here in canada um especially here in uh, quebec with our hydropower but some have even tried to make the argument to relocate the abundance of um of energy that we have here and 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 distribute it over here um there's not enough of that energy there's way too many people over here to to supply that kind of energy so that kind of uh option would basically just make us reduce our standard of living so that we're in the red with everybody else um it's not gonna lift anybody out um i believe china at this point because this graph was made in 2015 China is probably well uh, exceeded uh, UK, Italy, and Spain down here, and uh, maybe even uh, Russia, Germany, and France, which are not doing too well, uh, especially with this winter coming with their energy crisis. So um, this is a graph that Kuao made. It's a, he's a colleague of ours, which I will leave um, some classes that he did. He's a, he's a nuclear engineer, and he, he did two very good classes on uh, nuclear power and he was making the point that in order for this part of the world to catch up to this green well to this line basically you would need one nuclear reactor every three days for 30 years now as i'm going to go into in a little bit it doesn't have to even be that way um but all to say is that nuclear reactors are the fastest way to get to that point um, and I'll discuss, you know, fission and what the future holds for, for, for fusion. Um, but these other energy sources are not going to get you to that in 30 years time. Um, this is another graph that Cloud had shared showing the social pro uh, progress index versus energy. So it's clear that your access to energy as a country is going to determine your standard of living. There's no way around that reality either. So again, to deny certain parts of the world and their ability to provide energy, um, you know, the electrification in Africa is still an incredibly controversial uh, policy. I mean, it's incredible the the loans that they're because they their loans are approved by the World Bank and the IMF. They're approved or disapproved, and the electrification of uh, cities has been uh, something that they've been given a very hard time. So again, the progress in Africa is not just a lack of resources or a lack of get up and go for African nations, but there's also the global policies that are being enforced that are, are, are causing this lack of access to energy. Here's a picture of uh, Kuao holding, it's not actually uranium, it's lead, but that would be the size of a 300 gram pellet of uranium, which would be under uh, our uh, fission power today, enough energy for one person for, for 80 years. So 
I know that there are a lot of issues with people on nuclear energy, and I want to go into that just a little bit because this is going to be the determining factor in our future of whether we do live in a world of uh, limited resources or where we where we hit our carrying capacity will completely depend on how we approach nuclear in the future. So a lot of people are sketched out about nuclear waste and uh, breeder reactors are the solution to that. So we already have a solution that exists today for dealing with nuclear waste pretty much so that you don't have any waste. I know that sounds very surprising for a lot of people. So on the left, this is a normal reactor, which in three years, again, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, include the links to Klaus class so that you can have a more detailed explanation from an expert on this. But on the left, you see uh, spent fuel from a normal reactor. Um, you need uh, about 4% of fissile fuel in order to turn the fertile fuel into fissile fuel in which you get energy released. So once you go past, like you, you decrease from 4% to 2%, you can no longer use that fuel, even though you have 94% fertile fuel. And the problem with this is that you have, as you see here in the purple, heavy, um, I don't know the proper terminology, but it's like it's heavy waste. So, you know, sometimes when uh, a neutron hits, it can, act, it can produce a fission reaction or it can actually cause uh, the uh, element, the isotope to become heavier and heavier and and the, this is the most radioactive stuff in the fuel that can be radioactive for thousands of years if you see on the left uh sorry on the right um in a breeder reactor you have a lot more fissile fuel to begin with um and after so many years you still have a lot of fissile fuel and uh you have this heavy um fuel here and what what we can do uh, is we can take the spent fuel from normal reactors, we can mix them with the breeder reactor, which has 20% high fissile. So it will, you know, dilute that fissile, but it'll still be well below uh, 4% or 2% fissile, right? That we saw in the waste of the, of the normal reactor. We mix it all up in a reprocessing plant. We add natural re uranium, and you have a closed cycle at that point. So that the heavy material, the heavy, dangerous radioactive material, is just constantly being put back into the plant uh, reprocessing plant until it's it's uh, it's it's used up, because a neutron can either cause it to become heavier or not. So it can actually turn the heavy, uh, the heavy elements into um, fissile products if it's put through the cycle enough times. So you never have to deal with this radioactive waste. It's always, you know, within the cycle. So the only products that you have coming out are the fission products, which are radioactive, much less radioactive, like maybe, you know, uh, you know, 200 years or so they, they have like a, the longest one is I think a half life of, of 30. But these fission products actually have uses. So they're, it's not actually waste, it's actually a resource that we can use for many different things. Um, one of them being uh, medical isotopes which are very important and uh, Kwa again he goes in his through in his class that we can use these things for a lot of other things as as well we can also use the heavy uh the heavy elements i think they're called transuranic um for certain things as well um Kwa says that we have transuranic products in our smoke detectors which i don't exactly know how that works but all to say is that you have these kinds of uses um for these things so the other concern with nuclear energy is, uh, you know, the incidences of Chernobyl and Fukushima, Fukushima. Now, there is a lot of stuff up for debate on this, but I, I'm going to just focus on um, the the uh, the approach of the radioactivity was there what was the damage that occurred after uh chernobyl and fukushima 
So you see here, this is like a television capture of, uh, you know, radioactive rates that um, Pandora's Promise, a very good documentary, um, they were showcasing. And they were making the rightful point that, like, who understands these numbers? Most people, they don't know, like, the top one, uh, 6.2 millisieverts and uh, millisieverts and the exposure limit for nuclear plant workers, Philly, 50 millisieverts. I mean, it doesn't, what does that mean to the average person? Um, the issue, I'm going to go into those levels, but I also want to make a point. This is just from Wikipedia. The number of deaths that we know for certain occurred, it seems, with Chernobyl, but it's still, you know, the the recording for that was a, a lot less accurate for Fukushima, Fukushima is uh, fewer than 100 deaths. In terms of the long term uh, consequences, I'm going to go into that in a little bit, but in terms of like the direct consequence of it, which happened 35 years ago, we're saying fewer than uh, 100 deaths, and this was directly attributed to the accident. Okay, for Fukushima, they have uh, 16 physical injuries and one confirmed, they say, cancer death, which I would like to know the details of how they determined that. But one, one confirmed death, which they're associating with cancer, and 16 physical injuries for Fukushima. But the argument is, no, it's the long-term consequences that we need to be uh, fearful of. The, the radiation that was released into the environment, we, we need to be concerned about this. This is another thing that Quao went through in his uh, class, that the way that they are estimating the cancer rates that are going to happen in the future, where we're going to have three-eyed fish and things like this, is through the LNT, which is a, a linear non-threshold measurement. So um the way that that occurs is again this is this is a great example that Quao had used uh he uses the example of vodka so you know you can you can do this measurement for anything but let's say that if you have a whole bottle of vodka within an hour you have a 50 percent chance of dying if you have two bottles of vodka between two people you have statistically one death produced from that because it's 50% times two is 100%. So you have one death if you drink this within an hour. Now, if you have two bottles, so two bottles within an hour equates to one death, no matter what, in the LNT approach to measurement of, of harm. So if you have two bottles now split between 10 people, um, you have approximately 10% of the volume each. Uh, you will still get statistically one death. And if you split two bottles between 100 people, because two bottles always equates to one death if you drink it within an hour, they will have 1% each and statistically you should still get one death. So you can see by this way of, of measuring um, a harmful substance in the environment, it's not, it's not a very accurate, reliable measure. Yes, possibly, if you drink one vodka bottle within an hour for one person, you might have, you know, a 50% chance of, uh, of dying. But you most certainly do not have that as you continue to, to take that statistic and uh, spread it out. So, uh, you know, this is what really is the reality is that there's more of like a threshold and then you might even get uh, this might not even be accurate you start to have a, a somewhat of a linear relationship to radiation and health but for a certain uh, point it's not even um harmful like with vodka as well right you have a certain amount but i would argue that this isn't even necessarily super accurate obviously with high radiation doses it, it can be problematic this is um something that was taken from Pandora's Promise, where they took a, a, a Geiger meter and they measured the radiation levels throughout the world, because uh, a lot of people might not know this, but we have a natural background of radiation. So 
uh, you know, in Los Angeles, it was measured to be 0.09. In New York, it was measured to be 0.12. Tokyo, 0.14. So these are all uh, cities. In uh, and what was found is that uh, radi background radiation actually increases with elevation. So you would think if you're living away from the city, if you're living like in a on a mountaintop in the middle of like nature, that your your uh, radiation background levels should be lower than in the city, but actually it's higher. This is a picture to the left of uh, over the Pacific 2.13 New Hampshire or uh, on a mountain is uh, was a 0.32 or, or no, what was that? Um, and then like on a, a Brazilian beach, it's 30.999, um, which actually, you know, there's there's been shown to be benefits, right, for uh, some of these beaches, these hot springs that have high radiation levels. There's there's actually health benefits associated with this. Same thing with people who live in high elevations. We've seen that people oftentimes are in better health uh, when they're living at a higher elevation. Um, these are measurements to the left. Uh, the top left is the village by Chernobyl is 0.91. This is a uh, the top, uh, bottom left is a uh, right by the Chernobyl factory. It's a uh, or plant. It's 3.67. Uh, to the top right is uh, the village in Fukushima 0.18, and to the bottom right is uh, by a nuclear uh, waste storage container is 0.7. Um, and in the case with Chernobyl, since we have the 35 year measurement, um, there were many people who moved back to their homes uh, relatively soon after the, uh, the, the issue, uh, after the event. And um, there has not been any evidence of increased cancer. And you could easily measure like the background radiation in certain areas that have a higher uh, uh, radiation level, wouldn't you see higher rates of cancer formation? And you certainly don't. And as I've said, you actually see benefits, you know, uh, in, um, in a lot of situations like high elevations or close to the close to the beach. Um, just to give you another idea, banana uh, contains 0.1 microsieverts. It's uh, actually relatively radioactive compared to um, things that we eat. And it's just giving you an idea of the kind of radiation dose that you would have with bananas. Like if this, if this ships, if you, if you were told that this ship uh, to the bottom right sank, but it was with like a different kind of material, right? You would be highly concerned with a number like that. But if you were told that 50 million bananas sank, you know, in the ocean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't be too worried about it. This is another uh, chart that just puts things a little bit into perspective in terms of radiation, um, in terms of bananas. And uh, this is a, a very useful graph because people uh, think that you know nuclear plants are unsafe. As I already showed, there weren't really um, a lot of deaths, certainly not for Fukushima. Um, and Chernobyl, I would say that it's not really uh, accurate information to know exactly how many people even died from the uh, the, the situation, but um, it was still less than 100. Um, anyway, Chernobyl is a bit of an outlier in these things, but the, our world and data actually shows, and this goes for any kind of chart that you're looking at, nuclear energy is always very low in the number of deaths associated with that energy source. So it's actually the safest. It's always among the numbers of wind and solar. And depending on what chart you look at, such as uh, this one, it is the lowest in the number of deaths associated, just in terms of the maintenance uh, of it and, and, um, and uh, what we can correlate to it. So where is this coming from? that nuclear is uh, unsafe. Um, this is also just to give you an idea of the kind of material that is required to build solar panels, uh, wind panels, and, and, and nuclear and so forth. And you can see that uh, solar, hydro, and wind 
um, actually require a lot more uh, material than nuclear does. And it's argued, you know, that solar requires more material than it's worth in, in producing it for its level of efficiency. Um, so why don't we have more nuclear power? Well, one major issue is obviously the funding is just not there. Um, that's, again, uh, a political reason. And, uh, you know, people, they always say, Oh, fusion, they they it's going to be the next 30 years, the next 50 years. They're always saying this. Well, funding is obviously a big issue for, you know, something like a tokamak, although we see with uh, work like Eric Lerner's um, fusion uh, LLP um, that you don't even need a big tokamak. You can you can build these uh, efficient fusion reactors in a much smaller um way that uh could still be incredibly uh energy dense but if you look at the amount of uh spending this is a, again a graph that jason ross did if you look at a few how much a fusion crash program has been estimated to cost which if we were to just hear that number 60 billion around that's like incredible that that's totally not worth it but then in context to how much money we've already spent on uh renewables and yet we're still in an energy crisis, which, you know, I don't have uh, enough time in this to discuss the the political and the economic reasons for why we're in an energy crisis. But all to say is that the renewables, which uh, Europe, for instance, has become increasingly more dependent on, is not working out for them. Um, ba, 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 ba. So, how much time do I have? Um, so for for the uh the issue with pollution fusion power is the way to go fission as i've already shown is already uh environmentally it, it is right now the cleanest and most powerful energy form that we have uh fusion um is even it's it's much much more efficient um and also there is absolutely no waste to fusion and it's uh much safer than fission, although fission is still uh, quite safe now um, by today's uh, standards, it's it's very safe. And what kind of a world would we have with uh, fusion technology? Well, uh, the fusion plasma torch has the capability of reducing things to their elemental forms such that landfills could be reduced to their elemental forms, their, their isotopes. So um, this obviously is a very big, it's a game changer in terms of like what is a limited resource at this point we can we can basically make any material we want uh we can make um we can make material that we can't even make today um with the fusion plasma torch um and uh i don't really have time to go over how it works but um you can check out the video all the world's mine and uh, it goes through it very nicely. Um, and again, to give you an idea of, uh, of resources, um, although you don't have to do this, right? Because you can just break down any of the material you don't want to use anymore that normally you would consider waste and you could reuse it and, and, and it would become a resource. So again, in the future, our whole relationship to waste and resource is completely revolutionized. Um, but just to give you an idea of how much resource is naturally in the ground, you know, this is a, an interesting graph. If we were to use the plasma torch, we could get um, 100 uh, times the, the annual production of tin, um, six times the annual production of zinc, um, eight times the annual production of iron, and 200 times the annual production of aluminum in just the US soil. Um, but again, it's not not really necessary, but it just goes to show how everything is plentiful, you know. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if that if it can be any more clear. Um, and this is just a picture of a table of elements um, and the things that are highlighted are man made. Um, from what Matt has explained to me, uh, the transuranic elements so far, because the way that the table of elements has been constructed, we were able to have like, you know, we were able to predict elements that we hadn't yet discovered. 
Um, but there are still elements that we haven't discovered that we know exist, but we've only been able to uh, find them through our own man-made innovations. So that's also very interesting, you know, that we were able to make these elements before we found them in nature. Um, so yes, fusion economy, most certainly, it is the end to limited resources. So it calls into question, if we already know about this technology, why are we still going by this 1973 computer program from the Club of Rome, which was clearly like really off the mark? Um, and why are we forcing countries to follow those types of policies uh, when we can have a bright future, plenty for all? It doesn't have to be a cutthroat zero sum game. And uh, I'll just end it with uh, what China is doing now because the International Space Station, I don't know, I think they keep changing the year, but I think they're gonna continue going until 2024. And uh, Tiangong, the heavenly palace, uh, which is China is just doing this all on their own. And you know, people should be aware, China was disinvited from participating with the International Space Station. Um, the International Space Station, they have decided, uh, you know, uh, that they they don't want to continue maintaining it. So if it wasn't for China, we wouldn't have a space station uh, that would be continuing into the future. And China has very generously, um, you know, offered this to be open to everybody. So this isn't just, uh, you know, a China show. This is um, something that they uh they want to have world cooperation on and it's small it's much smaller than the international space station but the way it's set up is that you can always add more pieces so it can grow very big over the years and depending on the kind of collaboration that they have it, it can it can grow quite large um and uh recently you know uh these three uh is it taikonauts or cosmonauts i forgot which term it is but it's a uh, taikonauts I cannot. Uh, yeah, is a sorry for my pronunciation, but Jai Jigong, Wang Yaping, and Wang. Oh, oh, I just wrote Wang. Well, I wrote Wang Yaping twice. Sorry for the third guy, unless Quan knows his name. Um, but they have recently successfully um, launched uh, mid October, and they will be. Uh, at the uh, the China space station for several months, I think six months. Um, and again, this is just uh, an inspiration for the world, uh, not just for for China, because it 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 reminds us that we really don't have limits, and our growth doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a very positive thing that can be in harmony with nature with the universe and uh, we, we can have a happy future.